Okay, so John, introduce yourself. I'm Dr. John Salerno. I have a, an alternative complementary medical practice in New York City. I'm a board certified family practitioner and we do a lot of testing for heavy metals among other things. Uh, we do uh, bioidentical hormones, um, weight loss, of course. And um, I am very excited to go over Tamara's lab results uh, <laughs> as she is our great tester of heavy metals. And we wanted to make sure that the tester was healthy, of course, and we got to <laughs> keep her healthy. Yeah, but, uh, this is pretty exciting. I, I've been wanting to do this for, I don't know, maybe 10 years. Um, I just haven't because, you know, like, I, well, what do I say? My, when my mom was married to a guy who was a contractor who worked on people's floors and their fixed their bathrooms, her, her floors never got fixed and her bathroom never got fixed. And so it's kind of the same thing, you know, when it's the Yeah, no, that's do. so true. <laughs> but we're, we're going to make sure we keep you nice and healthy. But I will say, taking a look at the um, heavy metal test that we did for you, of course, I have to say, we do thousands of these probably in a year, or, you know, and, and pretty much every day. We believe that everyone should be tested as uh, we would with cholesterol and lipid profiles, for example, because it's really that important. And the effect of heavy metals on our health is uh, you just really can't say enough about. But on the surface, again, and looking at your heavy metal reports, it's really very, very uh, significantly uh, much lower than the average, I have to say, and I'm really impressed with that. Um, being saying that, there are some metals that are in the moderate range, and you happen to have one, two, three, four in the moderate range. But again, it's a very distinctive profile, meaning it's probably within the top 5% of um, our testing group, meaning 95% are much worse than this. So very impressive. <laughs> you are certainly avoiding uh, what you're testing for, which is great. I, and um, I, had, I had two thoughts. You know, I thought that either I could come up really hot because I'm doing this all the time and I'm interacting with people's things and going to houses that are toxic and I could, I could end up being really hot for lead, for example, or I could be really low because I'm actually more conscious of it than most people. So I was really yeah. happy. Yeah, me too. I'm really very happy with this. This is really excellent news. And again, you don't find this every day. This is something I'd see maybe once every three or four months, if that much, particularly in New York. Again, we test patients from all over the US and, and Europe, um, but I will say this is really an excellent report. There's a little bit of barium. There's a little bit of gadolinium. Did you have a gadolinium? You did have an MRI at one point. Oh, you? that's what that's from. I was looking at that. I'm like, what the hell is that from? Yes, I, I, I broke my leg 18 months ago. And I have uh. had more medical procedures than you can imagine. And that's probably from that. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, they'll tell you that the gadolinium um, washes out of your system. But obviously, it doesn't. It's oh. still in your system from the MRI. And in many countries in Europe, for example, they, they have a banned gadolinium testing for that reason. So it's in your, uh, in your tissues, in your joints, at, but it's not at a very high level, thankfully, but it's still there. So, you know, we use something in New York called IV DPTA. It's a specific IV, um, basically amino acid specific for gadolinium, which we've been treating a lot of lately, unfortunately with many patients getting so many um, gadolinium contrast MRIs. But in your case, I think just generalized um, detoxing, cilantro, garlic, sweating, maybe colonics. Uh, there are some nutrients you can take like zeolite, for example, um, glutathione we love and we use a lot orally. Wait, I heard uh, colonics and I like got this, I got flashed back to the early 1990s <laughs> when like everyone and their brother were all like having colonic nah, parties. 1970s, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's come back again, you know, as they say, things are starting to become popular. But yeah, I mean, and again, you don't have to do it, but maybe once a month or so, but it does help to detox. No now, question. I remember when I lived in New York in the 70s, uh, I, I was hanging out with a lot of people that were doing all kinds of, uh, at the time, brand new alternative therapies. And, uh, and one guy sent me to this really old woman. She must have been 90 an old black woman from the South 
who uh, gave me a colonic and, and played the piano, uh, New Orleans style piano while I was having the colonic. It was, it was really an interesting experience. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, for, for me, I was in Marin in the early nineties and my ex-husband and I used to go on like colonic dates, which was just like outrageous. Um, yeah. yeah. That's well, maybe fun. that contributed to the lack of heavy metals in your system too. Believe well, it or not, this will go back a lifetime. It goes back a lifetime because it's stored heavy metals. Yeah, and I, was, I was wondering about that. Obviously, I have lead exposure from my childhood. I helped my mother <laughs> renovate our house when I was a kid. I worked on historic homes growing up um, as a volunteer in Boston. And I also did, um, I, we, we repainted our boat and our boat um, you know, we had our sailing boat every summer. We would, and every fall, we would, you know, winterize the boat. And every spring, we would get the boat ready. And there was lots of um, painting and prepping there. So, so I'm yeah. not surprised about the lead from a historic perspective. But you just explained the gadolinium, which you know I was really suspect about when they gave me that stuff to take. I was really, or I can't remember. Was it an injection? I was freaked out about it. Whatever it was. Yeah. They, yeah. They with IV. Yeah. Yeah, intravenous injection. Yeah, unfortunately, but again. You didn't retain too much, but enough that it should come out. You know, and then I'm looking at the uranium. What are your thoughts about the uranium? Yeah, that's really very interesting. It it could have also been part of the contrast that they gave. Um, did you do any other testing like uh yeah, everything. I've I've had I was going to the hospital two to three times a week right after I broke my leg and I had two surgeries. Oh, well, and yeah, it's likely related to that. I mean, uranium um, is a radioactive substance, of course, you know, yeah. uh, but it's likely, we also find it, believe it or not, in New York, there's runoff from radioactive um, testing. We'll see it in drinking water, for example, because it's runoff from the hospitals, oh, believe it or not. So, and, and do you live near a hospital or no? Yes. Yeah, well, we're, we're right across the river from the hospital. We live near a very toxic river, and um, and there's often pollution warnings from the river, and we swim in the river every now and then because it's Oregon. You know the kids, oh, mostly, but you know. Yeah, I mean it's possible that, that that's also a source. We'd have to investigate that, you know. And and the problem with uranium is it can, God forbid, affect your kidneys. Your kidneys have not been affected that I've seen, thankfully. But um, you know, it's again these metals, although they're moderate amounts, they do have to be. Um, you do have to detox. The other two are barium and cadmium. Now, barium, when I'm in my work, I find barium in glassware. And I do have some glassware that I use pretty regularly that has some barium in it, but I don't know of any other source of barium. And I was told um, through some of the, and through some of the research I've done, I've, I've seen that the barium is added to glass as a glass hardener and that it's not supposed to be bioavailable. But I have always cautioned against people using, uh, for example, the Pyrex Visions where that, that brown, glass pyrex stuff that your grandmother used to use or your mother used to use that because the barium levels in that glassware is like 4,000 to 5,000 parts per million and so I don't use anything that is knowingly that I know that's really high in barium. Well I noticed that it seems from that list uh, to be implied that mm -hmm. the low threshold of detection for lead was what 1.2? It's not micrograms per deciliter though. It's oh, oh I see. yeah. Yeah, it's a different uh, denomination. Oh, but, well, uh, you know, it's interesting. We do see barium, for example, in nuts, unfortunately. Um, seaweed, certain fish will have barium. Yeah, so, I mean, it's unavoidable to some degree. There is going to be exposure to barium. But, um, again, yours is of moderate, and I've seen significantly higher levels. You know, we had patients, by the way, an interesting story coming over from uh, Switzerland, the watchmaking capital of the world, and they were drinking water and swimming in Lake Lucerne and they had nickel toxicity oh. and it was from the manufacturing we discovered of the of the uh, watches and the runoff into the lake in Switzerland and they come routinely they've done several maybe 40 50 IVs with me to get the nickel out because they didn't know what to do in Switzerland for them and they were quite ill so I mean you know it's so important to pay attention to these things and you're right maybe your barium is also coming from the river this is my poison, coffee. So I don't know, you know, what I'm getting from my coffee. I try not to think about it. I drink. Yeah, it. you're right. But but I have to say you've done a good job. You <laughs> don't have a lot in your system. You would not essentially be a candidate for detox IV wise with me, although it would expedite the removal. The only caveat to that is the gadolinium. You might instead of using like we use DMPS. IV for mercury, you would use a different, slightly different form of that, or I would 
for the gadolinium called the PTA, which is um, more specific to uh, detox gadolinium. And then lead, we use calcium EDTA if you were to do IVs. But again, you're really not a candidate per se. And if you did, you'd probably only need four or five IVs. And you're certainly welcome when you come to New York. We will do it. But uh, you're, you're one of the rare ones. You're doing <laughs> well, real well. I know you have patience to see, but I have a couple other. Qu can I ask you a couple more questions? Of course. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, first off, there's no iron listed here. I was curious about why. Iron's yeah, no, iron good. isn't considered a toxic metal, although okay. you could make a point for it at high levels it is, but you're right, but it's not so, considered uh, that. Well, in men it would be. In some men, right? in yeah. some men. Well, what the interesting thing is that people always ask me about nickel toxicity when, because I recommend stainless steel as a rule, and I'm really happy to see my nickel level is relatively low, um, and stainless steel is something we use on a regular basis, so I'm really excited to see that correlation. Um, but then the... Um, question I had was, um, well, or I wanted to bring something I wanted to bring to your attention was, um, I had fish a few days before I saw you. I had tuna. Shh, that's my other poison. <laughs> oh, wow. I, well, I, here's, that's a very good question. So let me explain that because that really uh, is important the way we tested you. So since you had an issue with sulfur-based drugs, we thought, and from your history, <laughs> We had to do the oral, um, slightly sulfur-based to oral DMSA. We did not use DMPS because it's intravenous and that is a strong sulfur-based uh, chelating agent. My suspicion is that if we had to do this test with the IV DMPS, it would have pulled more mercury out of your system. So I always tell patients, if we're doing it orally, you may have to multiply the amount of mercury by four or five because you have to adjust for the difference in oral versus IV of the chelating agent to draw it out. Okay. And that's probably why it's not showing up, uh, but, but clearly uh, tuna is an issue. Well, and it was only once and it was a small amount. It was like in a very fancy New York restaurant. Right, you don't do it routinely though. You don't have a tuna routinely. No, I don't. And so, but it was just a few days before. So um, I thought, huh, this should show up or maybe it won't show up, whatever. And then the other um, question I had, um, I guess, so So I was mentioning this to my friend uh, who, who's in the natural health community as well. And we were talking about, well, my recommendation to the clients is that that these tests are really the most useful when you have a compar com comparable test done at an interval. So you do one test now, and then if you think you've had an exposure, then you do another test later, so you, have a baseline, and yeah. you have a baseline. And I was wondering about your thoughts on that, like the, the relative um, uh, usefulness of, an, of a single test versus the need to have multiple tests over the course of time. Yeah, that's a good question. So firstly, if we're doing chelating, if we're doing IVs, and even if we're doing oral agents, we like to test after a month or two to compare baseline to the, the and we would do the same exact testing procedure with the same nutrients intravenously or orally. Um, it is a good idea to continually test so that levels don't start to spike, even when you're not doing IVs or if you're just doing oral chelating. It is a good idea, and we try to do it every two three months or so in New York, which is important. So you do want to see if there's a change. Sometimes what we do is we do a non-provocation or an unprovoked test such that we can see what's, what's coming out without provocation versus what comes out with provocation. And a lot of times they do recommend that, but in the interest of time for our patients, we just go right to the gist of, um, of putting the uh, chelating agent, you know, IV in, intravenously into our patients to do the provocation test because a lot of them come from out of state or it's it's not um, it's time consuming and they'd have to do two visits to do that. But but again, good questions. Yes, we like to follow trends. If there's a rise, and then we call you to investigate where these exposures are, and we will be doing that quite often now yeah. that I know the great work you do. Uh, so. And then I guess one last question is. Um, what, what about the validity of both of, of, of hair tests and also then, of course, blood tests have their own um, um, place in all of this. But what about doing a, a urine test, a hair test, and a blood test to kind of get a full, more full picture? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's a good question. So here's the problem. The hair only goes back to the length of, of if you have nice, beautiful, long hair, but it would still only go back about a year and a half, maybe two years of exposure. The challenge test goes back, the one that you did, goes back a lifetime. 
And the blood test only goes back about three months of exposure. So what I do is we do blood and then we do the challenge. We do not do hair. Hair is not allowed in New York anyway. It's oh. not licensed. So, uh, but the blood will tell me if there's recent exposure, it allows us to play a little bit more detective work. So if I see, for example, that you have uranium now, and it's also in the urine, it means you've been exposed over the last two or three months. If you don't, it means it's just older exposure that we're picking up and you're not currently exposed to it. So we do that pretty routinely on everyone such that we can play detective and see if it's acute or if it's an older uh, exposure, chronic, that's stored in tissue. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. Oh, you have a question? <laughs> no, no, I just, uh, that's great. Uh, very nice to meet you. And uh, yeah, likewise, you generous time. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, for okay. Definitely um, come visit if you're in Portland, Oregon ever. And I'm working on my October trip. So I'm, I'm planning on heading out to New York again in October. Um, you know, but I can come if there's an emergency. So call me if you need me. Yeah, there might be. I will. <laughs> That's great. Keep up the good work. And nice meeting you also, both of you. And Tamara, I'll see you soon, honey. And keep up the good. You really, I mean, it's an excellent report. Much better than most. It makes my job a lot easier. Just keep, <laughs> okay. Thank you just so keep much. Keep it up. Okay. <laughs> take Talk care. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye-bye.